Welcome back to the data science and machine learning track, everyone. Uh, next up, we have Matteo, who will be telling us how to speed up our model scoring with Hummingbird. Over to you, Matteo. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, hi, I'm Matteo, and um, today we'll talk to you about uh, Hummingbird, a project that we, we have been, uh, Carla and I have been running in uh, Microsoft for pretty much a little bit longer than uh, one year. Um, so let's get started. So just to set up a contest, uh, this is uh, Hummingbird works over ma uh, for machine learning prediction serving. So just to make sure that we are all on the same page. Um, so uh, in machine learning domain, you have some data and you want to uh, learn a model by using some uh, train, um, um, some train algorithm. And once that you learn your model, you basically want to deploy it such that, such that customer can use it. And this is what we call prediction serving. And, and this is where basically Hummingbird is going to, to help you. So this uh, prediction, uh, prediction part, not on the training side of things. Then when we started this project, we, we basically look at the system that were already out there, they were able to do uh, model serving. So there were a couple of specialized system uh, such as Onyx Suntime, TensorRT and TVM. But what we found is that this system were mostly focused on uh, deep learning. While uh, support for traditional machine learning method was, uh, we found it was completely overlooked. And here for traditional machine learning, I mean, the type of uh, machine learning model that you implement using, for instance, scikit-learn, ML.net, or H2O. So we basically uh, look a little bit on how this, uh, how much this machine learning model were used, and we found it were actually quite popular. So if you look at this 2019 uh, Kaggle sur survey on the state of data science and machine learning, you basically uh, see that the top used methods are actually uh, traditional machine learning methods, not uh, neural networks. Then we did an analysis on uh, our server at Microsoft, and we basically crawled um, the publicly available uh, Python notebooks on GitHub, and we did two uh, crawls, one into the, for uh, GitHub, for a snapshot of GitHub 2017, another one for a snapshot of GitHub in 2019, and we basically look at the the library that were important in this Python notebook. And what we found is that um, scikit-learn was the fourth more used uh, uh, library. And while TensorFlow was, I think, the seventh, while PyTorch is not, is not even here, I think it is around the 12th. And another important factor is that scikit-learn is actually, between 2007, the snapshot of 2017 and the snapshot of 2019, scikit-learn is actually growing uh, faster than and TensorFlow and PyTorch put together. So basically, now that we found that the uh, prediction server for traditional machine learning methods is actually an important problem, we basically try to look in, into how we can um, optimize uh, optimize this um, uh, prediction survey for these uh, traditional machine learning uh, models. So what we found is that uh, uh, these traditional machine learning systems, such as second learning, were mostly optimized for uh, for training, while while they're not that optimized for for serving. And what we found is that since the traditional machine learning models are basically uh, the algorithms were implemented using imperative code and in a dot fashion, there were kind of no logical abstraction that allow uh, the from a system professor allowed to do optimizations. Um, and uh, and for this same uh, for this same uh, uh, reason, we also find that it is kind of hard to run your traditional machine learning models on hardware accelerators. This is because, for instance, your, the, this uh, algorithm were implemented uh, in Python and there is no uh, natural way to run, for instance, Python over FPGA or, or, or over GPUs. Same thing for, for the Meldonet, it was implemented in C Sharp, there is no way to kind of target the kind of implementation directly over different hardware accelerators. Then what, how, how these traditional machine learning models look like, just to make sure that we are on the same page. So here I have also an, an input record containing like four columns and one single row of data. And then I want to do some binary classification. So my traditional machine learning models, once it is trained, it basically return zero, one based on, um, uh, you know, based on, 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 on what we're we are trying to classify. So if we, if we look inside this uh, traditional model, th these models are basically implemented as a graph of operators. And sometimes you also uh, see that these are referred as a pipeline, even if they're actually a graph, they're not, they're not pipeline. So in this specific simple case, we basically have uh, a bunch of operators that do featureization. So they get the, 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 input, uh, um, uh, the input row, they split it, 
uh, they split the categorical value from the numerical value, then they do scaling for the numerical values, they do one-out encoding for the cat categorical one, then we do concatenation of the feature vector, and then we pass this into uh, the predictor, which is in this case is a logistic regression that will tell us whether uh, whether uh, for this specific record is uh, uh, the final result is zero or one. Now, if we do a, a step backward and we, we look at how the deep learning system work, so so first of all, this the, all the deep learning system they are based on on the abstraction of tensor, which are basically multi-dimensional uh, array types. And then they basically uh, models are basically expressed as graph of these tensor operations, and you basically do featureization and um, and the model part basically all together by just expressing everything using these tensor operations. Um, so what we find is that basically this uh, deep learning uh, prediction service systems such as uh, TVM and Onyx sometimes they basically exploit this tensor abstraction to basically support multiple. Um, uh, deep learning models such as uh, PyTorch, TensorFlow, etc., and then also multiple uh, target environments. Uh, for instance, you can you can start with the PyTorch, TensorFlow, etc., and then you can compile your neural your training neural network model into TVM or Onyx runtime, for instance, and then you can use TVM and Onyx runtime to run your model over GPU, CPU, FPGA, ASIC, such as the TPU, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the benefit of this kind of uh, this design is that first of all you get really efficient implementation because you basically have an abstraction and and operate and uh, operations are working over this abstraction and your operation can be really really specific and really efficient for that specific uh, uh, things that you want to achieve. Um, this design is also declarative, such that you basically can implement your neural network using this tensor abstraction. You don't really care how the neural network is actually executed, right? Um, in, on the same, on the same, um, on the same way, uh, you can also kind of run your neural network over different hardware acceleration. You just basically implemented the neural network once, and then you can run over different hardware accelerators. And because of this, you can we claim that you can basically reduce the engineering effort because you basically you don't need to have like specific implementation for the different uh, hardware the hardware accelerator that you want to target. You just have one single. Uh, high-level implementation, and then you let the system decide how to more efficiently run over different other accelerators. So this basically is um, how we um, we framed our Amimer project. So we have this deep learning uh, domain that uh, where you basically have this deep learning prediction serving system that can get us input a neural network model implementing PyTorch TensorFlow, and they compile it uh, using this tensor abstraction into different hardware accelerators. And what we do with Timingbird is basically try to converge the traditional machine learning world with the neural network world. So the, the goal of Hummingbird is basically to try to translate the traditional traditional machine learning, trained traditional machine learning models into this tensor abstraction so that, such that we can take advantage of the, uh, the, the uh, neural network prediction service systems to accelerate and to run traditional machine learning models over uh, hardware accelerators. Now let's look into this uh, conversion part, which is basically the the heart of uh, uh, Hummingbird. So the, our summation is that um, basically the uh, traditional machine learning uh, uh, pipelines are composed by two classes of operators. So one class of operator, we call it algebraic. And as an example, you can think as linear regression. It's basically just, um, uh, it's just basically a, an algebraic expression. As you can imagine, uh, uh, implementing uh, this kind of uh, operators over uh, tensor uh, operation is quite easy. It's just basically a matter of implementing uh, uh, the, the type of algebra expression using a tensor algebra that uh, uh, the, um, the you know the PyTorch, PyTorch and other uh, neural network system provides to you. Uh, Another set of operators is algor algorithm operators, and these are kind of think of uh, like random forest and one-out encoding. So this kind of uh, algorithm operator are harder to translate because they, uh, as the, the name that we choose uh, say is basically they, they implement an algorithm. Like a random forest, you implement a tree traversal. In uh, uh, in one-out encoding, you basically get your categorical feature and you map into zero ones. So these are algorithm, and since they are algorithm, they can have arbitrary access part and arbitrary control flow. And these are harder to kind of implement using. Uh, the tensor abstraction. So our solution to this problem is basically try to introduce a redundancy, but in now we do the computation and now, the, and now we store the model such that it make a little bit easier to um, basically um, 
translate the algorithmic operators into tensor operations. And then what we do inside Diamondbird is that based on the amount of uh, redundancy that we add, we can um, uh, we can basically have put, uh, different potential way of compiling uh, or compiling uh, one uh, traditional operators. And basically in Diamondbird we have implemented a simple heuristic, for example, for trees that will tell you that basically will pick based on how many uh, tree in your ensemble or how many or how that are these three. It basically pick which is the right implementation. Now we'll see. I guess that from your side is super high level. So let me be a little bit more precise, and and I will do this by going over a simple example. So here on the left, I have a, a simple decision tree that contains four decision nodes and five uh, leaf nodes. So we in in uh, let me show you how what I mean by introducing uh, storage redundancy and uh, computation redundancy. And now we can, and how we can imp uh, implement this decision tree inference using just matrix multiplications. So let's assume that this is the input feature vector that we want to basically uh, use to do the prediction through this decision node. So let me start with two uh, data structure that we use to basically encode the decision tree structure. So the first data structure is a matrix A, where we have basically one column for each decision node, and we put one for the row, uh, uh, one where for the for the eight row where basically we want the we want to use that feature for that particular node. So if we look at the first column, it will be the decision node I1, and we use feature number three. Therefore, we have one for feature for in the third uh, for the third row if we see column number two so it will be decision node i2 in that case we use a feature two and in fact we have one in the in the row in the in the second row then we have a second um uh, data structure called b that basically this contains all the three shells that we have for the decision nodes then we have other two data structure uh, c which is a matrix that basically contains one column for each leaf node in our decision tree, and we have one in each row, uh, in, we have one when we basically encode that we go uh, left for a specific decision node, minus one instead if we go right. So if we look at C, first column, so if we consider, uh, we are considering uh, leaf node L1, we basically have uh, two one and two zero zero, that means that we go left for the first two decision nodes. In fact, as you can see on the decision node, we do left for a one, uh, we do left for a one and left for I2, and then we have zeros for the other two decision nodes because they're not considered. If we, instead we, we want to look at um, uh, leaf node number two, L2, uh, so this would be the second column, we have one minus one, which means that we go uh, left first and then and then right. Then for the other, for the other uh, 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 final uh, label node, I guess it is, uh, they just, they just a generalization of this. Then we have the final um, uh, data structure D, and D is basically uh, embedding uh, is basically a way in which we encode uh, the we encode the path for for leaching a leaf node. So uh, we have one column for each leaf node, and the value there basically is an encoding of the paths. In this specific case, uh, in Numberboard, we implemented a simple encoding that is just basically counting the one that we see in the in the in the, uh, in the matrix C, uh, C for a specific uh, for a specific column. So now let, let me let me show you how using this data structure we can we can basically do uh, a prediction over this feature vector for this decision uh, decision tree that we see on the left. So the first operation that we do is a is a matrix is a is a vector to matrix multiplication between the feature vector and the matrix A, and basically what we get as output is a vector that contains uh, for each uh, decision node that the feature that is used. Then we do a simple comparison with the matrix B that was containing the, the decision nodes, and by doing this, we can we now know which are the decision nodes that were uh, uh, that were actually uh, active. They were they were true uh, in this specific uh, for this specific input feature vector. Then we do a multiplication with C. We generate an encoding for the label path, and then we do we basically check the encoded that we generate with the, the encoded that we store in the matrix D. And in this case, we basically see that uh, uh, the only matching value is for column four, which means that, that the only label that will the, the final output label will be will be label four. Now you can imagine that this same algorithm is generalized over uh, three ensembles, so it's just just doesn't work, work only for decision tree, but it also works for ensemble tree, and it works by basically batching multiple multiple of these data structure together. So um, 
you can basically implement this uh, by using these strategies. You can basically implement a, a traversal of the decision tree using the generalized uh, matrix multiplication um, routines that you have in in the in tensor runtime such as uh, PyTorch, uh, TVM, etc. And as you can imagine, you basically introduce a lot of computational redundancy. And this is because we do we basically uh, evaluate each single decision node and we evaluate each single path. So we actually do a lot of, a lot more work than you will do in the normal case. But what we found is that since we can basically target the gem uh, implementations, which are really efficient and scale really well on, on modern hardware, if the tree is not too deep, uh, this implementation is actually quite quite efficient and can uh, can run quite efficiently on uh, uh, hardware acceleration as well. Now, of course, this this implementation will only work if the tree is not too deep, because otherwise you're doing an exponential more uh, work compared to a regular tree traversal algorithm. And in Hummingbird, we have other two uh, three uh, other two implementation for doing tree traversal. One that is called just a regular tree traversal, just using the tensor operations to do level by level uh, traversal of the tree. Another one, which is called a perfect tree traversal, it tried to first make the tree a perfect tree, such that we kind of know exactly how many iterations, how many levels we have. We can be a little bit more efficient on how we uh, we do the computation at the cost of introducing a little bit of uh, storage redundancy. And we find that this different implementation works well based on the algorithm that you have. Like for instance, like GBM tends to generate like a really, uh, really deep and really, uh, really skinny uh, trees. And in this case, the tree traversal is more efficient, while well, actually boosts tend to instead generate a more balanced tree. And in that case, generate a perfect tree is a little bit more efficient. And therefore, you can use the perfect tree traversal uh, algorithm. Now, in Amibird, we don't um, um, we don't provide just the uh, algorithm for uh, doing inference uh, prediction over tree algorithm. We, prod we provide around 40 or 50 uh, 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 operator implementations. So here I'm using uh, uh, a second learn. So for us, second learn, provi we provide like a, almost all the linear models. We provide almost all the three methods that you can find in in uh, in second learn. Uh, we can do um, uh, um, uh, clustering. We can do some feature selection. We can do the composition such as uh, PCA, and we can do a bunch of uh, uh, featureization such as uh, imputation, scaling, uh, one-off encoding, label encoding, feature usher, et etc. et cetera. Now, how the Hummingbird works, so you provide as input a trained uh, machine learning pipeline that can be implemented either on scikit-learn, XGBoost, like GBM, Onyx, and SparkML, and then through Hummingbird, we basically convert the trained the pipeline into um, uh, PyTorch uh, uh, models, and then we use the PyTorch uh, uh, exporting functionality to basically export uh, from PyTorch uh, TV, a TVM model, Onyx, Onyx model, otherwise you can just run your model uh, on regular PyTorch. Uh, we are planning uh, to also add support for other library, both as uh, as input models or as a target uh, runtimes. And we are welcome contribution in case you're interested in helping us with this uh, with this effort. Now, instead of showing some slides on how um, uh, fast I'm in Birdies, let me do a quick uh, a quick demo. Just to have an idea on uh, the kind of uh, uh, performance improvement that you can use, uh, you can have using Hummingbird. So here I have uh, uh, set up a Python notebook, and I'm trying to do a simple um, yeah, random classifier uh, classification, uh, a simple classification model, or using the the breast cancer, uh, the breast cancer uh, data set from provided by Scikit-Learn. So here I'm training a random classifier. A model with uh, 500 estimator and a maximum depth of seven. And then in second learn, you can just run uh, the prediction by using the predict API. Okay, and it takes around 63 milliseconds for doing a prediction over the full data set. Like now, if you want to accelerate uh, this model, we can uh, import Amenbird. So let me do import Amenbird demand. And then using Amenbird demand, we can uh, basically um, uh convert convert the model so let me first generate a torch a torch model using um using amember so you can do amember.convert and you pass your input uh second model and let's tell amember to convert the model into a pytorch model this will take a few milliseconds and now that you have converted a model into pytorch 
we can just do inference using the same uh, predict API of uh, scikit-learn. So in Amenbird, we added uh, the ability, we added on top of the PyTorch model, uh, Onyx models and um, TVM models, basically the same API that you will find in scikit-learn, so uh, the same predict API that you can find in scikit-learn, so it will be easier to kind of, um, easier for, for people that already used to, uh, to uh, scikit-learn to do prediction over their model. So in this case, uh, we're running PyTorch over a CPU, and uh, in this case, already Hummingbird is able to provide a 6x uh, performance improvement uh, because we're able to go from 63 milliseconds to 10 milliseconds. Now, since we have um, a PyTorch model now, um, uh, what we can do is we can uh, basically run the model on GPU. So in order to run a model on GPU, we just need to do to use the PyTorch to CUDA API. and uh, oh, sorry, there's a typo. There's a typo here. And then uh, this machine is actually equipped with uh, a P100 GPU. And then by simply, again, copy and paste and do predict over this uh, model uh, that now is a MBIS translator over over uh, the GPU, we can basically run the same prediction, uh, the same prediction over the GPU. Hummingbird will take care of moving the data and the model over over the GPU, and in this case, we only take one millisecond. So we are 10 times faster than the CPU, PyTorch CPU implementation, and already 60 times faster than the original second order model. Uh, now, Hummingbird pr provide you the ability to target the different run times. So um, among them, we support TVM, which is basically a, a compiler for neural networks. So in this case, instead of instead of telling Hummingbird to convert the model into into PyTorch, I'm telling it to convert into a TVM model. So I all, all, in this case, I also need to pass the uh, input uh, um, input data set. This is because TVM is a compiler and generate a model specifically for the, the batch size and the dimension of the input data set. Okay, also in this case, um, generated TVM model takes a few milliseconds and then see how, how fast this, how fast this, sorry, I have to put TVM here, not torch. Uh, let me, okay, let me try now with the TVM, sorry about this. Okay, now with TVM on CPU, it takes uh, just two milliseconds. So it's about five times faster than the PyTorch CPU implementations and uh, around 30x faster than the second knowledge CPU implementation. And with TVM, again, uh, in this case, we are code generating using LLVM um, a CPU implementation, but we can also generate code for CUDA. So I just have to pass like the, the, the device type. In this case, I set, I set it to CUDA. And in this case, TVM is generating some, um, some CUDA code. And let me try again. Do the prediction over this new, um, uh, over this model over the GPU. So in this case, this takes only 487 microseconds. So it's about two times faster than the GPU um, than the GPU implementations uh, that uh, we have in PyTorch, and more than an hundred x times faster compared to the original uh, CPU scikit-learn implementation. Of course, this is a um, sort of a cherry-picked example and kind of show you what are the performance improvement that you can that you can get from uh, Hummingbird in some of, in, in one of the best uh, scenarios. So you don't you won't expect it to have like seven one hundred x improvement in all in all the use cases, but in general, this will give you an idea on what you could achieve with uh, with Hummingbird. Now let me go back to my slides just to give you an update on the project. So Hummingbird is on is open source on GitHub. And we open sourced that uh, a little bit more than one year ago, and up to now we have around twenty one thousand uh, downloads through PyPy, and we have uh, around two point five uh, thousand stars. Um, uh, Hummingbird is part of the PyTorch ecosystem. It is integrated with the Onyx converter tooling. We also have a, pi a paper on Hummingbird at SDI uh, last year. So if you're interested in the technical details, please uh, check the paper. And the results that you have in the paper were actually validated by the, uh, the Artifact Evaluation Committee in the OSDI. In OSDI. Uh, latest features that we add to Hummingbird is support for uh, Profit, which is um, a time analysis um, uh, library. We support only the trend analysis, so not the seasonality, but this was just kind of a, to start the, 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 um, 
to kind of show that we also can support the time analysis on um, uh, on Hummingbird. We also add the PySpark support and as I show you, TVM, TVM support. And, and we are always look for new contributions. So if you're if you're interested in this project, please reach out on GitHub and uh, we have several uh, issues open that uh, uh, might need your help. And with this, uh, this concludes my presentation. So thank you very much. And I would more than happy to take your questions if you have any. So let's all thank Matteo. And if you have any questions, if you can drop them in the Q&A tab, uh, we, can, we can take them from there. So I'll just uh, give people a moment if they have a question. Sure. Um, but I, I will, uh, I'll start with a question. You, you demonstrated a, a very broad range of scikit-learn models that you support. Do you have plans to try and extend to full coverage of scikit-learn, or are there some models that are just going to be, you think, too hard to, to implement in, in a tensor operations? Yes, this is a really good question. So uh, I think we can cover probably most of scikit-learn. The things that probably we won't be able to cover are the text featureization. I think the text featureizer, the FIDF featureizer, uh, those require a little bit of string manipulation and and those are a little bit hard. So we we try to do that, but the performance were not like uh, super, super great. Um, uh, and you can imagine, like for instance, in PyTorch, they don't support string data types, so we need to convert strings into numerical data types, and then do all the, the operation over there. So that is a little bit what complicates them, uh, what complicates the uh, that. But beyond the text featureization, I think we should be able to target almost any uh, second term operator, uh, including, say, some of the the non non obvious prediction things like clustering and dimension reduction. Yeah. Yeah, okay. we already have like a K means. I think we also have mean shift. Uh, we have PC8. We have truncated SPD. So I think yeah, I think it should be should be uh, should be doable. Yeah. Uh, that sounds really great. Uh, are there any other questions for Matteo? Okay. Well, let's let's thank Matteo again, and thank you everyone for joining. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.